This video is going to explain how to start or how to teach stage one. Uh, this is a very common question. And I created the books and wrote everything down so that you don't actually need to have a video explaining it to you. But if that was not enough for you, or if you want more, I'm glad you're here and I'm happy to explain it to you. So basically you're gonna start with the teacher book. Okay, so you're going to look at the teacher book. Uh oh, we can't see that with the with my virtual background. If I hold it up here, it disappears. Um, you're going to start with the teacher book, and you'll open to the first pages. And I'm going to show you the digital version and share my screen with you, so that uh, I don't have to hold these up. Um, share screen. I'm going to share that one with you. Okay. So this is the table of contents for the teacher book. Um, you'll notice that it starts with frequently asked questions and introduction. So go ahead and read through those things. It, a lot of this background is important to understanding how the program works and what to do. So you're gonna read through, yes, you can teach writing, but I can't remember the rules. Uh, but I know, but I really can't write. And I know a lot of people really struggle with this. So I wanted to give you that encouragement and explain to you how it will work, even if those are some problems that you think you might have. Then I explain how I know this method works and um, explains the background of write by number because that's really, really helpful in using this program is to understand the concept, the larger concept of it. If you're just doing the mechanics of it without understanding the reasoning, you won't be able to make a little minor decisions or adjustments along the way. So make sure that you go through and read these things um, in the introduction. Uh, then there's a bunch of frequently asked questions. So you can go through all of those. Is my student ready? Um, what about grammar and spelling? All those kinds of things. <clears throat> then you'll notice, excuse me, <clears throat> there's an editing guide. And these are common editing marks. And make sure you know how to use them because you're going to teach your student um, what these editing marks mean. And because they're universally used, no matter whether they're homeschooled or in a classroom, they're going to be getting similar marks from other teachers. So teach them that when you underline three, that means to capitalize something. Use three lines. Or if you put a line through an uppercase, letter, that means to make it lowercase. Circle is usually spelling. Sometimes people will put an SP above it. Um, that's helpful. Anytime you see this carrot, this upside down triangle, it's called carrot. Um, and then underneath it, you'll see a comma or a period or a semicolon or quotation marks. It just means insert. So I give you some examples there. Close spaces, you just make those two lines like Pull them in, pull them in. These are too far apart. Um, new paragraph is two lines with a backwards P. Um, and remove, you just throw it away. And then switch is like a big um, thing that flips it. <laughs> Think of it as on an axis and it flips it. So those are really common ones. There are other ones, but those are the ones you're going to use the most. The scope and sequence is, is helpful if you have a particular skill you need to teach. You can look ahead and see when that's going to happen. Um, in stage one, you're just going to be teaching a sentence, which is a topic sentence and a first power sentence. Um, writing appearance, you're going to be teaching space between words and letters. Um, they're going to know the difference between uppercase and lowercase letters because, of course, when you're writing a sentence, you start with an uppercase letter. They're going to observe margins, which is huge as a teacher, teaching students to stay within the margins so that those margins are clear is really important. And writing neatly is important as well. And you can go back no matter whether you are um, all the way through, if you, every time you start a stage, go ahead and go and look at the scope and sequence. Um, then I also have in here what you're going to be learning for grammar. Normally, these are side by side, so it's easier to just read across. 
you have grammar, they're going to be learning complete sentences, and then they learn all the grammar they need to correct those things in their sentences. And so they're going to learn capitalization and punctuation, all their spelling and their natural vocabulary. Natural vocabulary is what people use in their talking. So right now, I'm using my natural vocabulary. I'm using maybe not all the words in my natural vocabulary because we as adults change our vocabulary based on who we're talking to. Um, so if I'm talking to a kindergartner, I'm not gonna use maybe my natural vocabulary. I'm gonna tailor my vocabulary to a kindergartner's vocabulary. But when I'm talking to um, a group of, let's say, professional teachers, my vocabulary will change to match their education level, the context of what we're talking about. I might use uh, terminology that only applies to the world of teaching that people wouldn't really understand outside of it. It wouldn't make sense to use it. It would just cause confusion. So, but children and learning writers will use their natural vocabulary. And what they'll do is they will tailor their writing to only use the vocabulary that they're comfortable writing. So for example, if your child has special needs, they might have a really great verbal vocabulary, but when they write, they sound two years old. So one of the goals is for them to start using a lot of their natural vocabulary, learning to spell those words. They know how to say, but they don't know, they don't know what it looks like on paper. Um, or they might speak in very complicated sentence structure, but they write in very simple sentence structure because they don't know how to punctuate properly or how to organize that complicated vocabulary. Um, you'll see this, it's really difficult in transcription. So for example, if I was going to be writing a transcription of what I'm saying right now, um, it would be, I would speak very differently. I would have to cut myself off in different places, punctuate differently because I'm not purposely putting periods after sentences. I just started that last sentence with because I'm jumping around and in spoken vocabulary, that's very common. You and I can understand that, but in writing, we can't do that. So writing takes your natural vocabulary and puts it on paper and that's how we develop voice. So how do I sound when I'm talking and I, can I recreate that exact same personality and expression on paper. And that's one of the joys of teaching writing is when you can hear that person's voice, that person's particular syntax, their structure, the way they, their cadence, their particular vocabulary, um, just all the things that make listening to them unique. You wanna hear that on paper. You wanna hear your child's voice and their particular voice coming through. You don't want it to be your voice. You don't want them to sound like their siblings or you or a particular author. Um, and I know that's a very popular concept is you want to teach them to write like great authors. But I find that to be very restricting in developing voice because then they don't learn to think thoughts in their head and say, I can put my thoughts on paper and retain my individuality. So it is great to copy great writers as just an interesting thing, but you don't want them to write. You don't want them to write like Hemingway. You don't want them to write like Mark Twain. You don't want them to write like, uh, you know, I don't know who else to pick at this moment, but you don't want them to just sound like other people when that's not at all what they sound like because it takes away their individuality in writing. Okay, that was a really big tangent. I might need to pull that out for a separate video segment. Um, so you're going to get to stage one. And you're going to look through. And your goal in stage one is just to teach that writing is not scary and overwhelming. A lot of students come into writing with a lot of baggage. They've already been frustrated by writing. Um, especially if they're older. If they're younger, they might be really excited to write and you wanna keep that going. Uh, but a lot of kids come into it and they're just like, oh, I can't do it. I, everything I write is wrong. I can't get what I want onto paper. When I do get it down there, it gets tons of red marks. I don't know what's wrong with it. So a lot of these first stages are developing a feeling about writing. I feel good about writing. I feel confident about writing. 
I know that it's okay, and I put that there, it's okay to write something incorrectly and then correct it. It's okay. It's not the end of the world. And you want to model that and you in your own writing and also in the way you communicate when they make a mistake. Oh, honey, you got that wrong. Here, let me help you with that. It's not, oh, why didn't you take the time to make sure? I mean, if you bring that kind of angst into it, you're not going to be helping. So don't do that. Um, and we want them to write about the things in which they are interested. Um, if they're interested in bugs, let them write about bugs. If they're interested in uh, trucks, let them write about trucks. If they're interested in video games, let them write about video games. Um, and I say this in the um, stage one teacher's guide, but you know what? Boys really get shut down early in their writing because they wanna write about really inappropriate things. <laughs> and if you have the ability um, I know that in a public school setting, you might not be able to allow them to write about in certain subjects, but if you are in a setting where you're, you can let them write about the things they want to write about, um, do it. Let them write about shooting their siblings, <laughs> you know, and poop and all these things that little boys are really into and running over, you know, um, you know, running over superhero characters with their cars, and they tend to be much more destructive. And I know that it's not culturally appropriate to say that, but it's true. And anybody who, who works with children knows that. They're, they're very different. Boys and girls are very different. Does that mean every boy wants to write about that? Absolutely not. Does it mean every girl wants to write about relationship things? Absolutely not. But generally speaking, that's what will come out. And so with boys, you especially want to allow them to write about what they're interested in. Um, they're going to be, boys tend to want to write about objects and things that happen. So they're gonna be more focused on their stuff and action. And girls tend to want to write about relationships, experiences, how they feel. This is, again, generalities because Everybody is different and that's okay. You can have boys who want to write about that and that's a great. They are uniquely made that way and we want to capture that. The whole point is let the kids be individuals and let them learn that their voice matters, that they have the ability to write about the things that are interesting to them. Um, so the goal, the objective here is the student will be able to, and this is teacher lingo, a lot of times teachers have to write objectives on lesson plans and turn them into principles. So it's the student will be able to write a sentence with no errors after correction. So that's your objective measurable goal, which for those of you in the teaching profession, you know it has to be objective observable a goal. Okay, for readiness, that just means, how do you know if your student's ready to do this? Um, to sit long enough to complete the task, so if it doesn't matter if the student is five years old and still can't sit in a chair for two seconds, and I had a son like this who would just fall out of his chair, he, could, he just couldn't sit long enough, um, he's not ready. Uh, they need to be able to handwrite. So hold the writing utensil and make shapes that look like letters. Um, spell phonetically at least. So have some sense of phonetics like sounds, consonant sounds, vowel sounds. Um, and comprehend writing instructions. So they have to be able to understand what you're saying and have a conversation about it to an extent uh, at their level. And repeat a task. So can they do the same thing again? It doesn't have to be right afterwards, but can they do the same thing over and over? Assessment is basically, can they, they just complete all the assignments? So once they are done with stage one, they're done. That's how you know. Uh, differentiation just means, how do I adjust for different kids? How do I make this work? So you can read the student book aloud to students with low reading comprehension and explain unfamiliar vocabulary. Um, students are in, who are unable to handwrite of any age may use assistive technology or computers so they can dictate. Um, there are programs where you just dictate that in. There's simple things like Google Voice or other kind of things like that. Um, 
And you could, if you're in a classroom or a co-op, students may read and edit each other's work to provide peer feedback and learning. And that's really helpful because students can learn from other students how to write different kinds of sentences. So they might kind of be stuck in a rut of always saying, I, know, I have two toys, I have two cars, I have two uh, cups, I have two this, I have, and then they see somebody else write, I went two places and they go, oh, I can use that. And they see somebody else who wrote, who wrote something much more complicated and the, their mind is like, oh, I can write that in a different way. So that's actually a really helpful tool. And if it's just you and your student, if there's just the two of you, you can write a sentence and have your student correct. And that's a really good learning tool because the student then learns that even my teacher makes mistakes. Um, and also they can learn to read your kinds of sentences. So that's a really great tool to use. Um, Cross-curricular integration. Um, obviously, you can use Write by Number with any subject. So it doesn't have to be a separate time for your school day. If you don't want to, you could use it in conjunction with history or science. Um, you know, we did two experiments in science today. And obviously, I wouldn't recommend doing that all the time, but because we do want them to develop a voice and, and want them to be excited about writing about the things that they're interested in but it it does make your day shorter so that's something to think about also on the overview page you're going to see common core standards um, this is for people who are in charter schools or in public schools who are required to, to write down on their lesson plans what standards this meets so that's just for there for convenience the the goal of right by number is not to meet common core standards it in fact it does not you can look uh, for kindergarten, for kindergarten, it only meets uh, writing standards one and five, and language standards one through one and two and six. So, if you have to meet all of those um, things for kindergarten, you would also have to be doing something else if you have to meet Common Core standards. And then I put some resources there: the teacher book, um, the Q and A videos that are on writebynumber.com, and teaching videos. Which actually, this is the first one of those. Um, and so we're slowly adding to that library and writebynumber.com, but of course, always send your, your questions to us because then that lets us know what kind of uh, videos to put up. And then automatic grammar and usage corrections. So if you want to use like grammarly.com, you can use, um, just type something into Microsoft Word or any other word processor. They'll give you automatic correction. Google Docs does the same thing. And then the student materials are just the student book and a lined paper or spiral notebook. And that depends on how old they are. So if it's a kindergarten or first grader, if you're starting younger, just lined paper is fine. Um, you, I, pref I prefer for all ages spir spiral notebook, but I know for some students, they'll start still learning to write. And so you need the larger lines with the dots and all that kind of stuff. Um, so you can do whatever is best for your student. Um, I personally, with my older students, and then also when I homeschooled um, my kids and other people's kids, I started them with uh, in spiral notebooks, even when they were younger, because I wanted them to learn to contain their writing to that space from a very young age. It also helped them work on their fine motor skills pretty young. So that was my theory. We did handwriting without tears. Um, uh, for homeschool, and I did use some of those papers, um, their uh, papers, when we started that. Okay, so stage one. Um, in stage one, students will learn to correctly write one sentence. This sentence is called a first power sentence because it is a sentence in charge of the paragraph. It has all the power. It is often called a topic sentence. In stage one, this sentence will contain the word two. In stage two, we will add two more sentences to make a paragraph. So this gives you an idea of what they're writing and where we're going with it. So that, as I was giving you examples, I was giving you examples of sentences that start with the number two. And that's because eventually we're going to have them list two things. And this is the outline 
of what eventually will be full essays. So we start that structure from a very young age. And so again, I go through the goals, I give you more information um, that I actually gave you verbally already, the three goals, and then I give you a paragraph about what those goals are. Then you're gonna see some sentence examples. And you'll notice that the first few are very simple sentences like, I know two people, I have two toys. Those are very simple sentences that your younger students will start with. But if you're an older student who is starting this stage, then look at number 10, you might be doing something like, as I pulled back the blankets on my bed, two bugs jumped out at me. So depending on how advanced your student is, you're gonna be able to see pretty quickly where they are in sentence construction. So how does to teach stage one? You have three jobs, three in stage one. First, you make sure your students understand the lesson. Second, edit the assignment. And three, record the grades, if you're doing grades. So you're gonna miss stuff at first. You're going, I, I mean, I miss stuff all the time to this day, and I've been grading essays for 30 years. Um, you don't panic. You're going to learn with your student. You're going to grow with your student, and you're going to get better at it. Um, and it's also a great opportunity to teach your students that it's okay. Don't take your emotional baggage from writing and dump it on your students. So if you feel like a failure because you can't write, don't take that and throw that on them. Just Teach yourself, it's okay, I made a mistake. Everybody makes mistakes in writing. Brilliant authors have editors for a reason because when we write, a lot of times we don't see our own errors. We don't see that we skipped a word. We don't see that we spelled something incorrectly. Um, it's really important to have editors. So, I mean, just this book alone, um, I think I went through an edited, I don't even know how many times myself, I had other people looking at it and it was amazing to me how even though three or four or five people had already combed through it, they found errors. It's normal. And there's probably errors in this book. If you find one, let me know. I'm sure it's in there. Um, and it's it just happens in writing. So uh, model that to your students. That's so, 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 so important. And then I give you, in these early stages, I give you the difference between dependent and independent learners. So dependent learners are ones that cannot do this. So they can't read this on their own. They can't do write by number on their own. They're dependent on you. After the first couple of days, they'll probably be able to do it by themselves, honestly. Um, so you're gonna sit down, just read through the script and figure out, you can say, okay, we're gonna write a, a one sentence today and you're going, to, you're going to show them and you're going to show them where to start on the paper. You're going to model. So basically in traditional teaching, okay, so I'm not talking about like project-oriented learning or other kind of learning, but the way our school systems work here in the United States is we give instruction, then we give guided practice, then we give independent practice. So you, I've already covered instruction. Next would be guided practice. So you're gonna show them how it's done. Um, if they're dependent, if they're independent, they're going to look in the book to see how it's done. That's guided practice. And then independent practice means, can you now do this thing on your own? So that's basically what you're doing through there. If there are uh, worksheets that they need to do to help, those are listed down over here on page 20 worksheets that might help teach. If they don't need it, don't use it. That's one of the things that is um, important in this program. Don't make students do things that are a waste of their time. If they know how, the difference between two, two, and two, don't make them do a worksheet on it. But if they don't know it, use this worksheet or find something else that might teach them that. Um, all right, let me scroll back up to where we were. Okay, so then I also give you information about independent learners. Um, and specifically, if they're older, they're gonna probably, hopefully, do this stage in one sitting, probably stages one, two, and three is what I've found for seventh grade and up for sure. Um, unless they really don't know how to write a sentence, um, which happens, believe it or not. Um, I strongly suggest using um, pen or not allowing erasures 
because this will force students to slow down and carefully consider what they're going to write. And because it's one sentence only, it's not a big deal to rewrite. And if they learn not to make those mistakes in one sentence, then when they're writing a three sentence, five sentence, seven sentence paragraph, and they have to rewrite it, they're not going to be making mistakes very often and having to rewrite the whole thing. So it's really, really important from the beginning to teach students to write correctly the first time. Force them to pay attention to the spelling, force them to pay attention to the to indentations, capitalizations, period. If you let it slide and you let it slide because you're like, oh, they know, they know. And they're like, oh, mama, I know how to, I, I know that I should have capitalized that. Oh, Mrs. Townsend, I, I know I had to put it here. I just forgot this time. Guess what? It becomes a habit that they slide and they slide. And pretty soon you have a whole essay where things aren't capitalized, periods, punctuation aren't correct. And it's a nightmare. Trust me, trust me, trust me on this one. Um, I know that again, culturally, we don't uh, like telling students that they're wrong and they have to redo it. It's become very unpopular. But you know what? You are being kind to your students when you tell them that. You are doing them a favor because is it kinder? You think it's kinder to let them write a, a four page essay with all those mistakes and then have to correct it? It's not. So be kind to your students and teach them from the beginning that perfection is a goal that we're trying to reach in writing. It's okay. And we don't reach it. It's not the end of the world. Nobody ever is perfect. But at the same time, we want to try to be as perfect as possible every single time so that we have the habit of writing perfectly. So that when you are quickly writing a note to your boss, when you are in a classroom taking a test and have to write an essay, you can write as close to perfectly as possible. So this is kindness. I know culturally it's, it's not popular right now, but this is what works, I'm telling you. Um, and then it says for independent learners, of course, if you need to sit down with them and get them going um, and explain things to them, absolutely do that. Some will just want to read it and do it on their own. Everything they need is in the student book. So that's fine. And then I tell you how to grade it in there. So you just put a little A or however you want a happy face, whatever it is you want to do. And for the dependent learners, they're going to write a sentence every day until they can do one sentence correctly. And I give you the information below, um, which we'll get to in a second, about when to know when that it's correct enough, because remember, nobody's perfect. Um, but independent learners, I would just spend a few minutes on this. If they can do this easily, obviously they're just gonna move on to stage two in the same setting. Um, other than that, they need to spend 15 minutes per day writing first power sentences until they meet the requirements to move to stage two. And so then I give you a sample of what that looks like. So here it is. So this is on obviously the dotted paper and you see the date and just the sentence. Um, if you want to, you can have the date in the margin. I actually prefer that. And then I have students start practicing indenting in the next stage. And those are the worksheets that I went through. So uh, evaluation, some students write virtually the same sentence every day. That's okay, let them. They'll, once they get comfortable with the structure, they will start to get creative when they gain confidence, when they're exposed to more ideas, more kinds of sentences. If they have trouble coming up with ideas, give them, feel free to give them to su suggestions, but please try not to limit the content of what they're talking about because we want them to develop their voice. We want them to learn to express themselves, not always be doing what everybody else wants. It's a character issue as well. Um, I think I covered the other issues. I do mention about subjects and predicates here. S young students generally will not understand subjects and predicates. Um, they're just not at an age where they're developmentally able to analyze language. It's not a developmental stage that they're at. I, in the student book, there's a worksheet that explains, gives another way to talk about grammar in a way that's not grammary. Um, 
and but mostly they're going to learn good grammar and kind of understand what a sentence is through reading a lot. So just keep reading and keep working on that. And then there's an evaluation checklist. Have your students go through this checklist before they give it to you to edit. So does the first word of the sentence start with a capital letter? Are the capital and lowercase letters formed correctly? This is a big one for some students who use like capital letters in the middle of uh, a, a word. Now, I actually had a question from somebody not too long ago about their student uses capital letters for everything. And I said, that's fine. As long as then you need the side di size difference. So you have to see that a capital letter is this, and then the lowercase is this. If you can't tell the difference, it's not capitalized and it's not lowercase. So you need to really work on that visual. Obviously, when they're typing, that's going to come across really easily, but figure out a way to make sure you can tell the difference because a lot of students cheat, not purposely, but they get they slide by this by not being consistent with their capitals and lowercases. And then they just say, oh, that, that's lowercase. It's like, well, it's not lowercase. It's a capitalized, it's in a capital form and it's big, that's capitalized. <laughs> so we have an agreed upon way to write letters in our society. Um, we have a certain way we form capital letters to show their capital. And we have a certain size thing that we've agreed upon in English speaking societies. So if your student's like, well, that's the way I do it. And they're like, that's nice. When you invent your own language and your own writing, then you can do it that way. <laughs> but until then, we're going to do it the way that everybody will understand it because the goal of writing is to communicate. And if you don't communicate in a way people understand, there's no communication. So make sure that they understand that. Um, then does the sentence end with a period, an excla exclamation point or a question mark? Did the student use other punctuation correctly? Um, is there a proper spacing between words? Make sure they're not swooshed together or spread way out. Are all the words, words spelled correctly? Is the sentence complete? Um, does the word to appear in the sentence? And the to should be setting up for the next two sentences because there are ways to use the word TWO that don't really do what that calls for. So make sure that works. Um, and they're going to stay in stage one until the following is true. The assignments can be completed without frustration, that the errors in grammar, punctuation, and spelling are minimal or rare. This means that there might be one or two spelling corrections per day as new vocabulary is used. This is normal and should be encouraged. If students are only using words they can spell, they are not learning to spell all the words in their natural vocabulary. So, if your student is giving you lots of sentences and is only spelling the words wrong there, it's like the first time they've ever used it or maybe the second or third, um, then they're probably ready to, and they're doing everything else correct, then move on. Now, let me just say something about kids who can't spell. There are some kids who can't spell. It doesn't matter. You can, you can go through every spelling program on the planet. They will never learn to spell. I have met these people. <laughs> I, it's okay. It's not the end of the world. So if your child is that child, and if they're young, you might not know that yet. You might just be like, how come they can't learn to spell? Some students learn spelling through phonetics. Some students learn spelling through um, visuals. So they, have, they take a picture, so to speak, of the word in their mind, and they have to, they have to see it spelled out. Um, some students just know the letters. So like my very dyslexic son, he kind of has an idea what letters are in them in the um, word, but he doesn't pay attention to order and whether or not the letters are upside down or backwards or whatever. Like to him, it's all the same. So he might write does, D-S-O-E. Well, all the letters are there, I don't know like because he doesn't think phonetically, chronologically left or right because his brain doesn't do that. So spelling for him doesn't even make sense because words are just random. They're random arrangements of letters. Um, uh, for some people, they look at a, a word once or twice, boom, they've got it, no problem. Others, it takes 30, 40, 50 times. 
So don't get caught up on the spelling thing too much. Just, I would encourage you to get to know your students and know which ones you're gonna need to just kind of let it go. Uh, especially, especially because some students are really advanced verbally and need to move on just because they're, they're ready for these other things, but they can't spell. And so you don't want to make them stay in kindergarten because they can't spell when they're mentally 15 years old. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? I hope you understand what I'm saying. Um, make sure the first word of every sentence is capitalized and, and with proper punctuation. And that's how you teach stage one. Um, in the student book, um, it's everything I talked about. There's a lesson in there. Just read through it with them. You read through it ahead of time. So you understand it. Make sure you understand what's going on. The same examples are in there. The same worksheets, information. And in here, I have a very laid out ooh, explanation. I don't know why it's doing that. As to what... Um, as to how to structure the page, um, how to correct it, what it's going to look like. The same student sample is in there. The check your assignment is the same as your evaluation checklist. And then there's a little thing, why do I have to rewrite the whole sentence? Why can't I just erase? And there are two reasons for this. Number one, it forces the student to slow down and focus so that they write neatly and they think before they start writing. Um, when you realize that taking a few extra seconds to get it right the first time will actually save you time in the long run, you set yourself up to save a whole lot of time when you're writing a whole essay. And number two, practicing writing something correctly and seeing it done correctly on the page will solidify good writing habits. For example, if you always write where when you mean were, your muscle memory and your visual memory will continue to connect the wrong spelling with the word you want word you want. Correct practice leads to correct habits. This is incredibly important. So when we do not ever write anything correctly, we just get it edited and we never have to redo it. We never learn to do it correctly. It would be like, it would be like, um, I, I'm, I'm in teaching children to die, drive mode. Actually, they're all done, but we just got out of it. Um, up, I'll use basketball. If someone goes to shoot a basketball like this, which is incorrect, and I say, no, no, you have to do it like this, but I never make the student put their hands in the right spot and, and shoot correctly, they're never going to learn to shoot correctly. And in writing, it's the exact same thing. We're so caught up in the, well, I don't want to make them feel bad, or it's going to be so much work to rewrite. That's why we do only one sentence. We want them to rewrite. We want them to practice doing it correctly. We don't want them to go like this every time and go, oh no, that's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. No, no, no. We want them to do this. That's right. That's right. That's right. And then they do that without thinking and they never ever go back to that. So that's really important. Again, there are students who it doesn't matter how many times you correct them, they're not going to get it. Um, but that's the goal. And of course you make compensations for those students. Um, rules for rewriting the whole thing will change in the upper stages, but by then you will have developed good habits in the lower stages and you will not have very many corrections. Um, and I do say if you have special circumstances, special needs, whatever, your teacher might give you different guidelines. So you as the teacher have the right to throw that recommendation out the window. And this is why it's so important that you understand the background and the goal of the program. Because if you understand what we're trying to get done and the goal and what needs to happen, then you know how to adjust. You can say, you know what? I have to throw this piece out because my student has a special circumstance, but I'm going to accomplish the goal in another way. So feel free to do that. You don't want your students to be unsuccessful, but at the same time, um, try to maintain the goal of how do I still make, how do I hold my student to the same standards and still accommodate for their special needs? And then you're ready for stage two, which will be a one, two, two paragraph. So that is basically how to teach stage one and a lot of other stuff in there too. 
I hope that was helpful and not too overwhelming. Of course, if you ever have any questions, feel free to call. I won't probably answer. I'll probably get a message and get back to you. Feel free to email. Um, I love to answer questions and I love to help because I want this to be successful for you. Thank you so much.